the interview preparation for physicians. Okay, so and I'm Peter Fish. I'm a physician. I'm a teaching attending here at Monmouth Medical Center in New Jersey. I'm also a medical director for a hospice service in New York, and I'm a medical officer in the United States Army. I've been teaching for many years um, in different capacities, uh, and I've been uh, very, I've always paid very close attention to the more effective speakers and the more effective teachers. Uh, uh, and I want to share with you what I've learned because I'd like to see all of you succeed in presenting yourselves uh, so that you can achieve whatever goal it is that you have, whether it is uh, securing a residency or a fellowship or a position as a uh, full-fledged physician on a faculty somewhere. So you've probably all heard the expression, don't judge a book by its cover, uh, meaning that you should not be superficial and you should recognize that uh, people often have depth or there are circumstances uh, in which the initial appearance is not uh, does not tell the whole story. However, the other side of don't judge a book by its cover is that if the cover of the book looks bad, the book probably won't get read. So it is important to pay attention to your appearances. It is important to pay attention to how you present yourself if you want people to pay attention to you. So it's not a question about whether you are superficial or not. It's a question about presentation and demonstrating to the person to whom you're speaking that you're somebody who they want to spend more time with, whether as an employer as, or as a colleague. So I'm gonna teach you how to present yourself so that interviewers are impressed by your cover and wanna to get to know about what's inside. Now let's talk about what employers want. First of all, no matter how smart you are, the employers are not going to hire you and people are not going to listen to you if they don't like you. So people want to like you. When they are interviewing you, they want you to be the one so they don't have to continue these boring interviews with a thousand other people. They're on your side. They want you to succeed. And one of the things that employers or interviewers are looking for typically are happy, easygoing, confident people. Even if it is a serious job, or perhaps especially if it's a serious job, they want people who can manage the stress of the job in an easygoing, confident, and happy way. People who are nervous about an interview are potentially gonna be nervous and uncomfortable in stressful situations, and that's gonna be a mark against you. So you have to learn how to be happy, easygoing, confident, and how to convey that. Your likability and professionalism need to be presented during the interview. It doesn't matter if you're likable and professional, but don't show those things during the interview. You have to demonstrate them. Because after all, your achievements are already written on your CV. You do not need to have an interview in order for them to read your CV. The point of the interview is to share with them the things that are not on your CV. And then finally, Interviewers like spontaneity. In other words, if you're able to come up with something that is not predictable, if you answer a question in a way that surprises them, if you ask a question in a way that surprises them, they like that. We like that. Because as I alluded to earlier, interviews are colossally boring. Everybody sounds the same and looks the same after the first five interviews. So if you can surprise me in a good way, that is going to make you stand out. And spontaneity, after all, is very, very closely related to invention and to the ability to come up with ideas for research and the ability to recognize things that other people haven't recognized. So spontaneity is thinking quickly on your feet, perhaps being funny, noticing things that are around you, and being surprising in a good and productive way. So what, what about spontaneity? As I said, interviewers like spontaneity, but spontane uh, spontaneity takes preparation. It sounds like a contradiction, but to do things and to say things in a spontaneous way actually means that you have practiced in the past. Now, for example, telling a joke. Telling a joke off the cuff, telling a joke easily and spontaneously is not usually something does the first time they've learned what a joke is. They don't have to have told the same joke a hundred times, but they have to be well-practiced at telling jokes. 
anybody who's been in the kitchen with their mother uh, knows that it is sometimes something short of miraculous when she can look in the pantry or in the kitchen and see things that are in the refrigerator or in the pantry and just throw together a meal, apparently spontaneously. And that is an amazing thing, except that she has practiced for 20 years doing that. So yes, that particular meal may be spontaneous, but it's a result of practice. And this is one of the things that I'm going to invoke to you and ask you to bring forward during your interviews. We're going to find your strengths and you're going to bring them into the interview so that you are able to look spontaneous and bring forward your best qualities. Let me illustrate that point. And I'm going to illustrate this point with a, an unusual non-medical example. I'm going to show you a video of this guy. His name is Fred Astaire. Now, Fred Astaire, now Fred, Fred Astaire was a movie star and a dancer in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And what I'm going to show you is him just messing around with a hat stand when his dance partner is late and he wants to get to work practicing. And he's just going to sort of do something spontaneously. Okay. So watch. You're going to see him check his watch and notice that his partner is late. And then he's going to try and figure out how can he go ahead with his rehearsal without his partner. So the point of that was, it was pretty amazing to watch this guy dance, right? Um, and it looks like it's completely spontaneous. But in fact, he, for all of these routines, would practice for months to make it look like he just invented it at that very moment. Note that you see where the lighting is perfect, right? See these different shadows here? That's not spontaneous. All of this stuff is designed. Every single casual move that he has is designed. So that's the point I just wanted to make. I wanted to make you understand that looking relaxed and casual is something that you need to practice. And you're not necessarily going to have it perfect, but I'm going to show you how to get ready. Okay. So here's your timetable on how to get prepared. You're going to start three days before your interview. And here's what you're going to do three days before your interview. You are going to go online or go to the library and you're going to find classic papers in your area of interest. Now, if you are just applying for a residency and you want to go into, say, internal medicine and you're not sure what the classic papers are, then you need to go to an attending and you need to say, sir, what is the best paper? What's the most classic paper in treatment of high blood pressure and treatment of diabetes and treatment of sepsis. And then you need to find those papers and you need to, need to read them. Then you need to find papers on the most recent research in the area in which you're applying. And for that, you can go to the New England Journal of Medicine or you can go to Lancet. Or again, you can go to an attending and you can ask her, what do you think is the most interesting recent paper? All right, so that's about six papers you should read and you should know cold. That shouldn't take you too long. Then the next thing you need to do is you need to get online and you need to start investigating the program where you are applying. You need to know where it is. You need to know how long it's been there. You need to learn about who is the director of the programmer of the program, and you need to know your interviewer. Now, this is the kind of thing that we do normally in the age of social media. Uh, one of my attendings said that he was, uh, you know, kind of creeped out when people knew things about him. But that's an earlier generation that values privacy a, a little differently. Nowadays, it is flattering when people know something about you. 
And personally, when I find that I'm interviewing somebody who has bothered to do the research, who has spent an hour figuring out anything they can about my director and about me and about the program, that tells me that's somebody who does their homework. And I think that's a good, very good sign. So it is worthwhile doing that. So for example, years ago when I wanted to interview uh, at a program in California, in the San Francisco area, I looked up the name of the hospital. I found out when the hospital was founded. I found out why the hospital was founded. I found out what its population was. And this is all just on Wikipedia. Then I found out some history about the town. I found out why would anybody want to live there? What are all the great things about that town? I found out about all the things that were invented in that town. Again, this is all on Wikipedia. And then I found out things about the director of the program, how long they'd been the director of the program, what their specialty was, what they had done to make the program better. And then I found out about the interviewer and I found out what they had published and I read their papers and read where they trained. This all takes about an hour to find this information. It gives you background. It gives you the ability to have something to talk about when you are talking to your interviewer. It also tells you something about what is of interest to that program. If you go into a program and you tell them how much you love taking care of, I don't know, tennis injuries, and you find out that the uh, population is of uh, people who are all factory workers who don't have time to play tennis, they're not going to care about you, right? If you go in and you talk about things that are important to that program, they are going to care about you. All right. So and the other thing is you may find out that that program is not for you. You may find out that your interviewer is somebody that you just don't like and you really don't want to learn from them, in which case you've saved yourself a lot of trouble. So the research starts three days before the interview so that you can go back to it. You can write down your notes and you can have them ready. Now, another thing you need to do three days before the interview is you need to walk around like a crazy person and talk to yourself because you need to practice answering questions in a positive way. There are interview, interviewers that will throw you questions that are difficult. Sometimes they throw you uh, these questions because they wanna test you. Sometimes they throw you these questions because they themselves are not very informed. Just because you're a doctor after all doesn't mean that you necessarily know anything other than about how to treat sepsis. Uh, sometimes they're doing it because they're not very nice or they had a bad day but you need to take these questions that are potentially difficult or potentially insulting or whatever and turn them into a positive because reacting to them negatively is not gonna to be to your benefit. You cannot go and win the fight with the uh, interviewer because then you're gonna lose the interview. So no matter how negative it is, you need to practice turning it into a positive. So you're gonna get these questions. I see from your CV that you have never done a central line, done a procedure, interviewed somebody, learned something, right? There are some interviewers who are going to find the things that are what they consider to be negatives. Your response to that is, that is so true, and I'm so excited to get a chance to do that as soon as I'm with you. Or, that's something that concerns me too, and I'm looking for a program where I can learn those things right? So you've taken that negative and you turn it into a demonstration of your enthusiasm. Okay. So the next one, I've never heard of Jordania. I mean, what could be more insulting than somebody mispronouncing or, or saying the name of your country wrong? For example, my mother was from Denmark and she actually had people say, I've never met anybody from Denmark yet. I mean, it's ridiculous that people would say something like that. But what do you do? You use this as an opportunity to show how proud you are of being from Jordan right? You don't correct them. You just talk about all the amazing things that Jordanians have done and what an amazing place Jordan is, okay? How about this one? So I see that you're a foreign medical graduate, as if that's a negative. Well, guess who else, who else are foreign medical graduates? Uh, a dozen Nobel Peace or a Nobel um, Prize winners are foreign medical graduates, of course, right? And many heads of hospitals are foreign medical graduates. I myself am a foreign medical graduate. That's not a detriment. That is something that's actually I consider to be a positive. So what do you do with that particular one? You say, yeah, I'm so lucky to have gone to school 
in Jordan or wherever. And I'm really excited about having the opportunity to go to yet another place and learn. I think I can bring what I learned in Sudan or Jordan or France to bring it to you. Okay. And this last one, I see well, you, I, this last one, I see that you're wearing scrubs. Well, obviously you shouldn't be wearing scrubs to an interview, but sometimes these things happen. So if it happens that you were wearing scrubs because you were late, because you were doing a procedure, you don't apologize. You just say, yeah, I am wearing scrubs. I would have preferred to wear a suit, you know, to respect you. But as it happened, I had to cover somebody else and I had to come directly from the ICU. Okay. So you have to practice taking negative questions and turning them into a positive. Okay. Now, what's the next thing you got to do? Two days before your interview, this is after you've practiced flipping the questions from negatives into positives and after having read all of the other papers. Now you need to read your own research, okay? And you need to look back at your research with a critical eye because that's what they are going to do. If you have written in your CV that you've written papers, then when I see that people have written papers and I'm going to interview them, I print those papers out and I read them. And I want to know whether you know what you wrote because I'm going to discover a couple of things. One is I may find out that your name was tacked on to the end of the list of authors and that you don't know anything about it. That's a big problem. So even if you're the 27th author, you better know the paper. If you're the first author, you especially should know what you could have done differently or what you could have done better. You need to know that. You need to show that you have the ability to learn. So that's why you need to know your own research. You need to find the mistakes and you need to know them before the interview does. Okay? So absolutely know your own papers. Then next, you need to prepare a list of reasons why the program should pick you. And we'll get to that in just a second, because they're going to ask you. It's going to be one of the final questions. Why should we pick you? And you need to be ready with a list. And then you need to prepare an, inter an inventory of your accomplishments. Now, you may think I've already done that on my CV. You have. You've written all of your medical accomplishments. But as I said, that's already on your CV. You need to also consider your accomplishments that are outside of medicine because those are interesting. Those are things that have not been written down with which you can surprise or interest your interviewer. So what are your accomplishments? Well, we know about the medical stuff, right? You've done procedures, posters, publications, lectures. That's all written in your CV. What is not in your CV? Sports, family, cooking, music, fashion, social media. What have you done under the other stuff category that makes you different from the other 30 people that I've interviewed? I want to know if you're the best cook in your family. I want to know if you've done amazing things out on the soccer field. I want to know if you are a social media influencer, okay? That stuff sets you apart. That makes you interesting. All the stuff on the left, A, I've already read it on your CV, and B, it looks like what everybody else has done, okay? So you have to make a list of the stuff on the right-hand column and have it ready, okay? And you may not know the stuff that is in the right-hand column. You may need to sit down with your wife or husband or mother or friends so that they can help you uh, and come up with that list. All right. Two days before the interview, we started already about you know reading your own papers and preparing your inventory. Now here are some other things. You need to prepare for tricky questions, not just negative questions, but tricky ones. Now these are not specific. Often they are kind of broad and that's what makes them tricky because the answers are so diverse. So these are some of the tricky ones. Tell me about yourself. That's a horrible question because there are so many things you could answer. So it's very easy to get stuck and not know how to answer the question. What is your biggest weakness? That's kind of a gotcha question. That's kind of one where the interviewer likes to sit back and twiddle their thumbs and watch you struggle a little bit. What is your worst quality? I've actually heard interviewers ask that question. And then this one, which is kind of nasty. I have very qualified candidates applying for this position. Why do you think you deserve this position? Okay. So we're going to talk about how to answer this. And then finally, there's often a final question. And that is, 
do you have any questions for me? Right? And you need to have an answer to that. You need to have questions for the interviewer because they're going to consider you to be non-inquisitive and somebody who has not done their homework if you don't have any questions for them. So let's talk about how to address, tell me about yourself. Well, you can answer this in many, many different ways, right? It's like saying, uh, where are you from? Well, what does that mean? Does that mean the town, the country, uh, your ethnic background, your family? Where are you from can be answered in many different ways, right? So uh, tell me about yourself. You can talk about your upbringing, your education, your interests, your goals, your tastes, your sports abilities, art abilities, family, goals, okay? So you need to decide on one or two of these and have a very uh, fleshed out answer. So that when they give you this broad question, you can say, well, that's a broad question, but I, I think I want to tell you about this part about me. Okay. This is, these are some of the things that I think are important about my background. Okay. This is your opportunity to sell yourself as a well-rounded and interesting person. Nobody wants to hear, I was born at 2 a.m. on October 3rd in 1983. Right. You wouldn't want to read a book like that. It's boring. Right. Right. If you think about all the most interesting movies that you've ever watched, they almost always start in the middle of the story, and then they go backward and they tell you some of the background before they move forward. That's how you have to think about your story. You need to think about your interview right now is the middle of the story. You are jumping right into the middle of the plot, and then you go back and you pick out some interesting stuff that will advance the plot of the story. So go back and talk about your art. Go back and talk about your education or your interests. Okay. So that is how you deal with that question. What is your biggest weakness and what is your worst quality? All right. This is when interviewers want to see if you have any insight. If you are self-critical, they want to see if you are somebody who is a narcissist. Um, so here is how you do that because everybody has weaknesses and worst qualities. Look at these things. So these so-called weaknesses are weaknesses that everybody has. So just pick one. It doesn't matter. Just pick one. And then you can advance that as your quote unquote weakness, right? Trouble delegating because you like to do things yourself because you like to make them perfect. Fear of public speaking. Who doesn't have that, right? I'm not great on data analysis. Very common <clears throat> weakness people have. Micromanaging, I like to get in there and do things. It's hard for me to step back and watch people make mistakes, okay? These are very, very common so-called weaknesses. Just pick one and be ready to answer the question with one of those. There's nothing weak about it. You can just answer the question very easily because you've prepared in advance. All right, here's a, the tricky one. I have very qualified candidates applying for this position. Why do you deserve it? There's all kinds of subtext to this, right? I mean, you know, subtext meaning, you know, things like, oh, why would I give it to a foreigner? You know, when I can give it to this person who was born in, you know, the U.S. Well, uh, the way to answer that is not to be defensive, but to say, well, I don't think there's anybody who deserves it more than me. And why is that? Well, you, because I think I'm going to bring something to your program because I have this background and I have this interest and I have this drive and I have this to prove and I'm very excited. And I think honestly, I'm the best person for your program. Okay. So can you see how I turned that around? It's not antagonistic. It's not in your face. It is just the belief that you have in your heart that nobody deserves it more than me. And this is why, because this is what I bring to you. I'm going to bring enthusiasm. I'm going to bring interest. I'm going to bring drive. Okay. And then finally, the, the last tough question, do you have any questions for me? Well, you need to look around the uh, interviewer's research. First of all, that should bring you a whole bunch of questions. People love talking about themselves. So the easy thing is to read their papers and then ask them questions about it. You could also ask about what the program is researching. Because if you're applying to a fellowship or residency, they are doing research. So you can ask them about that. And ideally, you will already know the answer to the question because you will have already checked on their website. But you ask anyway. 
You can ask them what the program strengths and weaknesses are. You can turn it around and see what they value. Okay. You can ask the interviewer what they think makes the program unique. And then they're going to have to think about it. Uh, you can ask the interviewer what they look for in an ideal candidate. So you're taking all of the questions that they've asked you and you can ask them the very same thing. And you can also use the power of the Zoom interview to your advantage. And that is while you're answering these questions, which you have rehearsed so much that you know, don't necessarily even have to be thinking, you can look around in the background behind the interviewer and you can see what's in their office. So you can see that they may have plaques on their wall, certificates on their wall. They may have family photographs. They may have trophies. They may have pictures of a place or of a boat or of a cricket pitch or something like that. So you take note of it and you can ask questions about it. Okay. And you can also ask the interviewer, what do they like or they don't like about the city they live in? Right. So these are very, very simple things. Do not just go down the list and ask every single question that I asked or that I showed you, because then that's going to look like it's rote. Again, remember the referencing the beginning of the talk. You need to look spontaneous. So you pick one or two of these and you have them ready. Okay, so now you've done your homework for the first two days. Now, one day before the interview, this is where you need to prepare how you look. So you need to get ready to prepare the stage. You need to make sure that the place where you're going to be sitting for your Zoom interview assuming that you're not flying to go and sit in front of the interviewer. Most of you, I would think, would be doing a Zoom interview. You need to find a place where the background actually has some interest. So don't pick a blank white wall or a dark room. You're going to look like you're sitting in a prison cell, which presumably you're not. You want something that is interesting looking, but you don't want to be in a cluttered or noisy room either. So probably being in your own living room at home is probably not a good choice, especially if you have pets or kids. Because if you have a cat, you know that the cat is going to jump on the keyboard at that very moment. And you may think it's cute, but your interviewer probably won't. So you need to pick a room that is not boring, but you have to make sure that it is secure. You can find a medical room or an office that's quiet and looks professional. You may want to borrow one from an attending, for example. Or you can ask the librarian in your library if there is some place where you can go. All right, so I'll show you some pictures of some do's and don'ts in terms of backgrounds. Now, once you've found a place, you need to have a way to remember all of this stuff that I told you. And the way to do that is to prepare uh, index cards for yourself. You can do it on paper, post-its, doesn't matter. But the point is, you need to write down things that you can have in your field of view for reference. So for example, the name of the interviewer, the name of the program, the name of the research programs, uh, the research papers, you can put them on cards written in large type in front of you so that they're not visible on the screen. And that way you can reference them. Ideally, you have them taped to the screen so you can just look at them and you don't have to sort them out. And just in the process of writing them down and sorting them out, it's going to help you to remember the information. But you never know if you're going to get nervous. So I would not just rely on your memory. I would put the information on the cards and I would put those cards in front of you. So again, names of the interviews, names of the programs, names of the papers, but also some of the questions. And also reminders to yourself. Sit up straight. Check your teeth. Uh, smile. Little pointers to yourself. OK, perhaps a picture of something funny so it can relax you. OK, so these are some do's and don'ts, which I know you've all seen on Zoom interviews, right? The, the guy in the upper left, you can't see him, right? Because he's in a dark room. He is not lit at all. He needs to have a light turned on in front of him behind the computer screen so that you can see his face. The woman to the upper right is sitting in front of a blank wall incredibly boring, plus she's wearing scrubs, and her camera is such that she's not looking at the interviewer. So that's a no-go. The man in the lower left is sitting in some bizarre room, which is distractingly disorganized, and we're looking up his nose. That's unacceptable. He looks sloppy. He's well-lit, I'll say that, 
but he certainly does not present like a professional. And then the gentleman in the lower right, having uh, uh, earbuds in your ears, uh, wearing a casual shirt and sitting in front of a sloppy uh, filing cabinet. All of these are unacceptable. Don't be any of these people. Okay. You want to look professional. You want to dress professional. You want to have a good background. You want to be well lit and you want to make sure that the microphone and the camera are working. You do this the day before because you do not want to be scrambling the day of the interview. Okay. The morning of the interview. Now, in your case, I guess it'll be in the evening getting ready for the interview, but it doesn't matter. The point is a couple of hours before the interview. Get dressed professionally early, all right? Don't wait until the last minute, because if you wait until the last minute, you're going to forget something. So you put on your professional clothing early. Even if that means you have to go around at the hospital in that clothing, that's fine. But you get dressed professionally early. Wear business clothing. Now, maybe you don't like to wear a tie. But the point is that when you go through the effort to look good, it shows respect to your interviewer and it shows maturity on your part. If you show up not wearing a tie and looking sloppy, you may think that the important message is, hey, look at me, I'm a cool dude. But what that's really conveying is, I don't care about you, interviewer. I'm not willing to go the extra mile to show you respect. That's the message that's being conveyed to your interviewer. So. Get a shirt and a tie and a jacket, gentlemen. Women, look for something that is business uh, appropriate and wear that on your interview. Okay, it's got to look like you. It's got to be, it's got to fit. You can't look uncomfortable, but you want to convey respect to your interviewer. Okay, prepare your equipment. I just alluded to this earlier. Make sure your camera and your microphone and your connection are, func are functional. They have to be functional. And you have to make sure that they're working. Now, hopefully you've done this the day before. And you should also do this the, uh, the day of, a couple of hours before your interview. All right. Prepare the area for the interview. So as I said, you want to keep the cat out of the room. You want to lock the door, feed the baby and the dog, turn off your phone, and clean up the room that you're in, okay? You may not have the luxury of finding a different room, but you certainly can clean up the room that you're in. So get rid of the clutter behind you, all right? Pay attention to what is behind you. Stand behind your computer, if you can, so that you can see what your interviewer is gonna see. If you have a boring wall behind you, maybe put up one of your certificates or get a house plant or put some books there, all right? Make sure before you even come to the interview on the day of your interview, that you've signed out your patients and you've hand over your, handed over your pager so that your patients are covered, okay? And then finally, uh, go for a walk or a run. You need to get your brain cleared. Don't go into the interview worrying about your patients. You should have already signed them out. You wanna go and clear your brain so you can be focused entirely on the interview. Now. Maybe walking and running is not your thing. Maybe cooking is your thing. Maybe reading something is your thing. It doesn't matter. You need to do whatever it is that's going to clear your brain before you go into the interview. All right, one hour before the interview, look in the mirror. Make sure that you don't have any sesame seeds stuck between your teeth. Make sure that your hair looks good. Make sure that you are presenting yourself the way you want to be presented, that your hair is combed, all right? and that you look presentable. Check your equipment again, because you know that equipment breaks, all right? Sign in 10 minutes early, not right on time, all right? You wanna be everywhere early. Now, actively relax. Now, this sounds like a paradox, but 15 minutes before the interview, you need to do something that gets your body into a relaxed mode because you cannot be spontaneous and you cannot focus if you're not relaxed. So do whatever that takes, meditate, Go on YouTube and watch something funny. Think of something positive, right? Make a cup of tea, whatever it takes to relax you. Get relaxed. Now, have a pen and paper ready by the computer because there may be things that your interviewer asks you or tells you that you need to write down. Now, even if you know that thing, you write it down. You write it down conspicuously. 
because it shows, again, it shows respect that you have the interest that your interviewer told you something. If you pick up your pen and a pad and you write that down, it shows, oh, that interviewee is interested in something that I just said. It's flattering to the person who's interviewing you. Also, they may genuinely say something that's interesting to you, and you may want to write that down because you probably won't remember. Again, turn your phone off. I cannot emphasize enough. It's never excusable to have your phone or your pager go off when you're being interviewed. Now, let's get to what's going to happen during the interview. As I said, you make a point of writing something down that the interviewer says. Next, look at the interviewer's background. If you signed in a minute earlier, you can see that there's stuff in the background. Make note of it. Remember it. You may be able to bring it into the interview. Be aware of your own distracting habits. Okay. Now, this is something that you can ask a friend or an instructor or a spouse. Do you do things that are distracting while you speak? Are there words that you repeat? Do you say the word, um, okay? Do you throw your hands around, right? Do you touch your nose too often when you speak? Be aware of those things. Make a note to not do that stuff because it's distracting and you don't want your interviewer to be paying more attention to you touching your nose than what you're saying. So this is something that you can practice and, and get rid of. All right, again, during the interview, relax. Okay, remember they're on your side. They want you to succeed. They already have your CV and they've already read it. You wanna tell them what isn't in your CV. All right. If they want to bring up your CV and bring up a point, absolutely answer the question. Make sure that you have your CV there so you can see exactly what it is they're reading. And you can hold up your CV and say, yeah, that's exactly what I said. That's right. Let me tell you more about it. But your job during the interview is not to recite your CV. Again, remember, they want to accept you. They are bored. They don't want to do 10 more interviews. They want you to be the one. So help them to see why you're the one that they should accept. All right. Be the nice, intelligent, collegial, eager, funny person that they want to be around. That's probably the most important thing here in this whole interview. You want to be that person that they want to work with. If you're going to be a resident, you want to be that person that they want to teach. Remember that you are one of the 1% of the smartest and most educated people in the world. It is so easy to compare yourself to other people who have done more than you. That is a problem that smart people have often. We immediately compare ourselves to our teachers <clears throat> or to our heroes or to the giants in the field. And we think, oh, I'm nothing compared to them. And we throw ourselves off by doing that comparison. Turn it around and look back and realize that you are part of a very elite, smart, and tough person who got through all of this training. You are confident. You are smart. You can do this. All right? So anytime you're feeling doubts about yourself, remember that. And remember also that your interviewer was once doing exactly what you were doing and was once in your seat. They were the nervous ones that were interviewing and they want now to pick you, as I've said several times, okay? Help them to pick you by looking good, by being prepared, by being confident, and being the colleague that they wanna work with. 